Well, I'm so grateful for you to join me today for our final session, our question and answer session on Textual Criticism 101. I am so grateful that you have taken the time to watch this over the weeks, and I hope that this is a helpful ending to our program here. Many of the questions that you have asked me over the last couple of weeks I'm going to put in a very short uh, form here that we can just go through as quickly as we can, knock these things off. It's going to be a short session today, but I just again want to thank you for taking the time and joining me today. Very first thing I'm going to get to. So again, these are based on the comments and the questions that you have asked me. You will notice again, I literally and figuratively have my hair down today. So we're just going to talk. We're just going to have the opportunity to gather together, reason with each other, work through some of the things that are on your mind. The very first thing that I was confronted with is, oh, my tendency during our sessions to say, oh, we'll get to that in a minute. And I know it, it drove some of you crazy. Here's the good news. It drove me crazy, too. Every time I said that, I'm like, oh, I can't believe I said that again. So I apologize to you for that. I know what was going on in my mind. Whenever I do something in front of a live audience and I'm able to interact with them, I can kind of visually see and get a cue whether or not people are thinking ahead or whether they're with me where I'm at. And my concern was every time I said something, I, I had these objections in my brain, going through my brain saying, I know I've got to address this. If I were listening to this, this would be my objection to this. And so it was this inner conversation that I'm hearing myself saying, yeah, but somebody's probably thinking this. Oh, I'll get to it in a minute. The good news is, is that I always did get to it in a minute, but I apologize for driving you crazy. That just reminds me that next time I really need a live audience, and I apologize for annoying you with that. I appreciate the fact that you work through that annoying tendency of mine. I will say this, it is kind of disconcerting maybe for you to understand that when I kept saying I'll get to you in a minute or get back to this in a minute, uh, I was having an inner conversation with myself. Anybody who's seen me knows that I'm thinking all the time and maybe you've seen me pacing and actually whispering and mumbling to myself, I will say, who are you talking to? Uh, nobody. <laughs> Well, I'm really not. I'm talking to myself. I know I might be committed if people are concerned about it, but I often have these conversations with myself, so I apologize for including you in that, and I thank you for tolerating that uh, over the course of these last few weeks. Um, after that, the number one thing that people kept coming up with is, who is this guy first, Clement? I mentioned Clement quite a bit in our second session on the Greek Testament as, as an author of one of the books that was left out of the Bible. Now a little bit about Clement. Clement was born about 35 AD and died in 99 AD. He became bishop of the Roman Church for quite a number of years in 88 AD. We, um, we do not therefore, well we know for a fact he was not a witness of Jesus Christ. He did not meet Jesus Christ uh, while Jesus Christ physically walked this earth. Jesus was uh, crucified, uh, buried, rose again, ascended in heaven before this man uh, was born. And so he's a second generation Christian. He didn't have an experience with Jesus Christ. However, his book that we call the book of First Clement, which is Clement to the Corinthians, uh, is a book that was very revered and respected by the early church. In fact, it is included, as we indicated in our discussion, in, um, in, in, in particular in the Coptic Bible. Uh, Coptic Christians, the Egyptian Christians. And so the question becomes is, why is it in ours? And I think it's kind of right down there at the very bottom bullet point. He was not a direct witness of Jesus Christ. The early Christians had to cut off the entrance into the Bible, books that, you know, they had to have, have some standard. And so I think one of the standards is the person must have had a direct eyewitness account of Jesus Christ. And because Clement did not, even though this book was very respected by the church, it decided that it would eliminate that book uh, from the Bible. And so we go on. Are there other banned books from the Bible? <laughs> and I use that kind of as a funny thing. You'll notice there's an advertisement for the History Channel down here. Banned from the Bible as though there were some massive conspiracy against the book, like Clement's book and some of these other books, to keep them out of the Bible. And I just think it's just such a, uh, it's such an intentional uh, attempt 
to in, uh, incendiary attempt to get people to turn on the TV and watch this, as though there's some massive conspiracy against these books. Um, there are some books in the Bible that just clearly were not written by witnesses of Jesus Christ. They might have been very outstanding books, like the book that we just mentioned, the aforementioned book by Clement, but that doesn't mean that they should be in the Scripture. There are some outstanding books that are written today. We're not all of a sudden opening up the canon of Scripture and adding them to the canon of Scripture. Um, Thomas Merton's book, there's books by Thomas Merton, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, by other folks that I have a great deal of respect, for whom I have a great deal of respect. We don't add these books to the Bible, but they are certainly witnesses to Jesus Christ and about our faith. That isn't meaning that we're banning these books from the Bible. It's just that we believe that as Christians, we want the witnesses of the, uh, 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 of the Bible that are written in the Bible as witnesses of the accounts and the events that took place in the Bible. And so that is the reason why in the New Testament we limit which books are entered into it. It's not that there was some type of censorship or scandalous type of thing going on. There are also books that are heretical. So there are some books, respected books, Epistle Bar Epistles, Epistle of Barnabas, the Letters of Ignatius, the aforementioned First Clement. These are all very well-respected books. You should pick them up, find them, take a look for them. In fact, I will make available a translation of the book of First Clement to anybody who wants to come to me and ask me. I will send you a PDF of that. It is a no, uh, no longer copyrighted translation that I'm welcome and free to be able to pass on to you. It was translated in the 1800s. And so I'd be very happy to pass it on to you. All of these books, you can actually find a good translation of them on the internet with just a little bit of looking for them. They're really good books, but there are other books that were rejected because they were heretical. I think the church, the early Christians, should have had a say and say, hey, look, we're not just going to include anything in the Bible. It isn't anything that goes. It's, it's things that, uh, again, uh, 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 books that affirm the faith that we're passing on. And so some of these books, the Apocalypse of James, the Gospel of the Infancy of Jesus Christ, the Gospel of Thomas, these types of books did not reflect the theology of the early Christians. And so, yeah, they were excluded from the Bible. But many of these books that were banned from the Bible were books that were written hundreds of years after Christ. So they were certainly and clearly not witnesses of Jesus Christ. So it wasn't so much that they were banned, it's that these folks intentionally were trying to write uh, documents or treaties against the Christian faith. And so, yeah, the Christian church said, we're not going to include those. That's kind of silly. I mean, think about it. That would be like including uh, a book by Christopher Hitchens, the famous atheist, in our Bible. Because it's a contrary point of view. We're banning it from the Bible. No, it just it doesn't support our faith. I think you should read Christopher Hitchens' book, God is Not Great. I think it would be good for every Christian to do that. But it doesn't mean it's something that should be included in the Scriptures. It doesn't mean that we're banning it. It just means that it doesn't reflect the values of us Christians. Uh, and our Christianity. A lot of the books that were so-called banned books, by the way, continued to be copied by Christians because they did think they were important. They wouldn't exist today if Christians didn't uh, copy them and pass them on. So even though they are not in the Bible, doesn't mean that they were banned. All right, let's go on. Another question. Um, this is one that's kind of more of a clarification. This is a missed opportunity. Oh, this is, this is beautiful. This is a copy of, of the Latin Vulgate. The books were so beautifully done, and uh, I missed an opportunity when I was talking about the King James use of the Latin Vulgate. I mentioned to you that they often preferred the Latin Vulgate to actual Greek text when they translated the Bible. And so I used a verse to demonstrate that. For there are three that bear record, and that red part, in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and the and there are three that bear witnesses on earth. In one sense, it doesn't make a lot of sense because it really doesn't fit, but it was something that was added by the Latin Vulgate to make to kind of probably clarify their theology. It was something that was picked up by the King James Version, put into the King James Version of the Bible, but we cannot find any witnesses to that uh, read in any Greek text, only in the Latin Vulgate. So it was clear that the King James folks took this from Latin Vulgate, not from a Greek text. 
And when I put this up here, I kind of pointed this out and blanked on what, why in the world I put this page up here. This is the United Bible Study, but United Bible Sto uh, Society's uh, Greek text, and this, of course, is Nestle Alan, uh, the Novum Testament uh, Grecia. Uh, and uh, what I really wanted to point out were, uh, was right here, where it talks about right here, which is in the text. These are... Um, uh, part of the apparatus in which they evaluate and show you why they evaluated to include certain verses and not include certain verses. I could point you all I want to and show you that it's missing this section of, of the Bible and you say, well, so what? Well, I just wanted to point out down here in the t text, it says in the Latin Vulgate. And here it puts the reading that's in the Latin Vulgate right down here. The same thing over here and the... Uh, the United Bible Study Version. So they didn't exclude it. They just wanted to show you that it was an alternative reading. They are not including it in their text. The reason is because the only text that witnesses to it is Latin Vulgate. No other text. Not the Byz any Byzantine text. Not any uh, Alexandrian text. And so they note that there. That's something you will not find anywhere noted by a King James only person. You know, because again, they're typically ignorant of these. Uh, thanks. All right, let's go on. Are there, are there, and somebody asked me, are there any other contemporary translations that use what we call today the Texas Receptus uh, Greek text, which is, um, which is from which the, the uh, King James Version Bible is translated? Kind of. You remember when I say kind of, because um, the Texas Receptus was something that pre existed the King James Version of the Bible, um, and a lot of translations in the 1500s used the Texas Receptus. The King James Version used the Texas Receptus as a beginning point for their Greek text, but then they added to it, changed to it, as they, we already indicated, they used the Latin Vulgate oftentimes um, in preference to many of the Greek texts that they were finding, and they created and compiled their own Greek text out of these texts. But it has now since become, uh, since been known that the text that the King James folks created has, is now kind of a reflection of what we call the Texas Receptus. Receptus. Even though it was not the Texas Receptus, it's become, I guess you could say, the Texas Receptus uh, today. And so the question is, are there any other Bibles today that are being translated from the same Greek text that the King James folks used to translate the New Testament? And, and the answer, the simple answer is, yeah, I mean, obviously the King James Version uh, the Gideons. The Gideons are King James only folks. If you've ever gone to a hotel and you get a Bible, a Gideon Bible, it will be King James because they're King James only folks. They do not believe that any other version of the Bible is a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. But what do you do if you're a Gideon and you go into a place where people speak Spanish? Well, they have a Spanish version, a translation based upon the Texas Receptus. So again, the Spanish Bibles, anything that has Gideon on it is going to be te uh, from the Texas Receptus. King James, New King James, Young's Literal Translation, that was something that was translated in the 1800s. Um, there is the modern English version. This is the only one that I could actually find that is a legitimate contemporary translation of the Bible that uses the Texas Receptus. I am not really familiar with the modern English version. I'm sure it's a fine translation of the Bible, but they wanted to try to stay faithful to King James uh, in terms of its form and how it functioned, but also give a more contemporary translation. Um, I don't know. I haven't read it. I'm not familiar with it. I've never held one in my hands. We've got this other one called the October Testament, and it's, it sounds really weird. It sounds like some type of revolutionary type of thing. Actually, what it is, it's... Um, it's an tr English translation. It's the English translation of, of Tisdale. Uh, Tyndale. Tisdale. <laughs> I've got jazz on, my, on, my, on my, my, my mind here, I guess. William Tisdale. No, this is uh, Tyndale, uh, William Tyndale, who, trans who is the first translator of the Bible into English. And so that's what the October Testament is. It's, it's his translation of the Bible. But almost every other translation of the Bible is based upon the United States. Uh, Bible Society's trend, uh, Greek text and the Nestle Alan Greek text, the Novum Testament Gratia. And so uh, I, I really don't think any other country in the world translates the Bible from 
uh, the Texas Receptus, nothing, nothing that I could find. All right, let's go on. Uh, <laughs> somebody said, don't you got a little bit too much rage about those people who are, uh, who like the King James Version of the Bible? And, and no, I actually don't. I have no, my mother will only read the King James Version of the Bible. I don't, I don't, I don't rage against my mother about that. I think that's fine. The, I use the King James Version of the Bible. I like the King James Version of the Bible. It's not my preferred version, as we discussed in previous uh, times together. What I'm against is King James only ism. I've got no problems if you want to use the King James Version of the Bible. Just be aware of its limitations as you are of any other translation of the Bible. The problem is, and what I, I do have a rage against it, and, and my rage is not really against the King James Version. It's a rage against those, uh, and, and not against those who prefer the King James Version. It is a rage about those who are willfully ignorant. Now, all of us, by the way, are ignorant. I'm ignorant of many things. Um, I'm ignorant of how to use a drill, how to cut my hair, maybe. So I might be ignorant of these things. I don't know how to do these things. I need some help in putting a door handle on at my house because I'm ignorant of these things. And in one sense, I probably have a willful ignorance because it's always nicer to pay somebody else or get somebody else out to put your door handles on. I, I just don't have an interest to learn. That's a willful ignorance. I don't care. And that's what I, that irks me, however, when it comes to Christians who base their theology on a willful ignorance and belligerence against the facts. That's a horrible witness to Christianity. Christians have always been the people who are, who are concerned about education, about learning. The scientific method itself is the creation of Christians who want to explore the universe. So, this, this is an anti-intellectual point of view, this King James onlyism, and very anti-Christianity. It's a dogmatic belief system. Um, so, I, I, again, I have a problem with folks who confront the Bible in a dogmatic fashion, who diminish, label, demean other people, to prove their point. They call them evil and wicked because you're not reading it the way I'm reading it. We build a wall that prevents the incorporation of new data into our faith. That's dogmatism. Now, by the way, this transcends Christianity in the view of the Bible. We see this in politics right now. Just go on to Facebook, for goodness sakes. You'll see your crazy left-wing and right-wing friends posting stuff that's absolutely ignorant and not well thought through. But they are so invested in a particular point of view that they ignore the facts, okay? That's a political dogmatism. The same type of ignorance. Um, the debate that goes on between the new atheists like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris uh, and, uh, and some of the Christian apologists who, uh, who debate in these debate stages on college campuses. There is such ignorance both on the, on the Christian side and, both, and also on the a a atheistic side because all they are is creating a bunch of verbal memes to be able to bash each other. I have no respect for that. Dogmatism approach, dogmatic approaches are always destructive to unity to understanding, to communication. And ultimately, this is really important, I believe that dogmatism is a fundamental lack of trust in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Basically says that we're not going to allow the Spirit to speak to us and transform our lives because I have to follow my dogmatic faith. Let go of your dogmatic faith. Let the Spirit convict you and guide you, maybe into some new territory that you've never explored before. All right, going on. Are there some scholars who believe that the King James Version is the best translation of the Bible? And the simple answer to that is absolutely yes. I have, uh, I, there are some very respected biblical theologians and scholars who believe that the King James Version is the best translation of the Bible. I've got no disrespect for that. The reason, they're not diminishing, demeaning, dismissing anybody. They understand, uh, they understand 
uh, the things that are at stake in the discussion about textual criticism, they have no disrespect for people who disagree with them. They're not bashing them and saying, you're going to hell if you don't believe the way I do. They don't, they don't do that. They just say, look, I just happen to believe this way, and here's my argument why. And so one of them, this guy, Dr. James Scott, uh, I'm not even sure if he's still living. I don't know. Uh, but I ran across him a while ago. He's a... Uh, uh, because, again, of my, um, my affiliation with Trinity Christian School as a track and field coach there, that is an Orthodox Presbyterian Church school. It's affiliated with the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Most of you say, who is, who is that? It's a very tiny branch of Presbyterian Christians, a branch of a branch of a branch of a branch. But Dr. Scott was, was very well respected. And um, he claimed that, and argued, very forcefully, the King James Version is the best translation of the Bible today. However, he also acknowledged that we still do not have a definitive Greek text from which to translate the Bible, and we can improve upon it. Now, I have some respect for that. There are some other scholars, uh, biblical scholars, that are in, mentioned in my bibliography. I made sure I put two books of two very well-known scholars who vehemently would disagree with me and my perspective that the better uh, Greek text would be the, uh, uh, the United Bible Society uh, and, and, of course, uh, uh, Aland, um, Nestle Aland uh, Greek text. So that's there. I don't want you to be ignorant of it. I think you should be make yourself aware of different perspectives. All right, let's go on. Um, some people say, well, how can I compare different translations? This is really difficult. If you don't read Greek, and here we are talking about a lot of Greek things with the Nestle Alan text, uh, with the Textus Receptus, and you say, I have no way to compare that. Well, I'll tell you what, here is a great place to go. The Bible Gateway, I have such respect for this site. I'm so grateful for them. Uh, I go to that site every week, at least, when I'm preparing my sermon. I'm able to see some of the other translations and how they're used, and then I'll often cut and paste the, uh, if you wonder where I get the text for my, my um, sermon handouts, well, I get it from Bible Gateway. I go there and I just copy and uh, I copy the text and I put it into my sermon outlines. Just a great resource because they have just about every imaginable translation, English translation of the Bible available on that site. I think they also have some Spanish translations and translations from other countries. It's just, so if you want to see how uh, the translations compare. What I would suggest that you do, if you can't read Greek and you can't compare the two different uh, competing Greek texts that we have available to us today, the Texas Receptus and, and the United Bible Society's uh, uh, Greek text, just go and compare the King James Version with the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Put them side by side. Read through them. You'll get to see. You may not be able to read Greek, but you'll see where decisions were made, where things uh, have been changed again. From my bias, the people who changed it were the folks who translated the King James Version of the Bible, and the more contemporary translations are attempting to get back closer to the original. That's my bias. That was my argument. But nevertheless, you get to see where the differences are. Here's the most exciting thing. When you see where the differences are, you're going to say, oh, even the one I disagree with is still communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? And that's kind of good news. All right, let's go on. One or two more things. Selective bibliography. This will be posted uh, in multiple different places, so you don't have to get out your pen and pencil and start writing these things down. You'll be able to download this. I will have it in a JPEG form online for you on the advertisement for this program. But this is just a selective big bibliography of some things. I am going to go through one or two items. You notice there is a uh, little star beside those that I think are probably more accessible for people, um, as, as for lay people to be able to read this. If you have no background with Greek or Hebrew or textual criticism or biblical scholarship, there are several books that really do a nice job laying it out for lay people so they can kind of understand what is at stake and why certain decisions are being made. Um, this one, this one actually might be the best one for you to begin with. Uh, the King James Version, King James Only Controversy, Can You Trust 
Modern Translations by James R. White. It's a, it's a really fine little book, and it's something you can pick up as a lay person, read it, understand what's at stake, and, and why, again, he's kind of on my, my perspective, why uh, the King James Version is not, uh, you know, as J.D., a member of our church, used to say, a bag of chips and all that. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a good, solid translation of the Bible, but we have, it can do better. And uh, we don't have to commit ourselves just to one translation. Very, very fine book for, again, a layperson to be able to access that. This one's a little bit, uh, a little bit more in-depth than George Elton Ladd. I don't even know if it's still in print. Uh, jo uh, George Elton Ladd is one of my favorite um, scholars of the you know, mid-1900s. Uh, very conservative biblical scholar, but also very knowledgeable. He was working on a systematic theology of the Bible, and he made it halfway through and died. You know, I was just sad, but I think that's what happens when you finally get a great understanding of the Bible and a very big breadth of it, and you decide that you're going to try to put into words what you've understood from the Bible. You're just running out of time in life. It's just, but he was just a great biblical scholar. He really does a nice, concise job. Um, this one is a little more uh, easy to get a hold of. It's still in publication, New Testament Textual Criticism, a concise guide. It's just a very simple book that you'd be able to understand some of the issues that are at stake in terms of uh, the Bible and so forth. So take a look at those. Uh, notice again, I did include two scholars whom I respect very much who disagree with my perspective. If you're a Christian who cannot tolerate anybody who disagrees with you and your perspective, you may be the problem. I read people who disagree with me all the time. And I learn from them. I learn from atheists all the time. I learn from people in other denominations all the time. I learn from people in other religions. Doesn't shake my faith, but I learn from them. So I think this is something that is good for you to understand. There are some very respected scholars who disagree with me and take just the opposite point of view. And so take a look at those if you're interested in that. In particular, this is the one, this one with the top one by Zane Hodges. It's kind of a, uh, it's a book of a lot of articles by biblical scholars, and it's a much di more difficult read. But this is probably the book for you if you'd like to read something that's written more for lay people, the identity of the New Testament. I, again, don't know if that's still in print. Uh, this this kind of dates me as a biblical scholar and as far as when I read these types of things. So hopefully that is of help. Again, that will be published for you. If you have any questions, if you want any more resources, I'd be very happy uh, to provide that for you. Well, that is about it. I just want to conclude today with this. I'm grateful for you to attend, your attendance. I'm grateful for all the, who took the time to listen and follow along. Uh, I'm glad that so many of you asked me questions directly. And if you have any other questions that I didn't answer, write me. I'd be very happy to respond to those types of things. If anything uh, pricks your conscience or comes out as a result of this and you just say, hey, look, I have a question about this, let me know. I'd be happy to help. Uh, the good news, and here's the good news that I want to leave with, which I was hoping I communicated effectively during this class. God is faithful to speak regardless of the text or translation that you might have in your hand of the Holy Bible. Every translation makes mistakes. Every scholar makes mistakes. The King James folks make mistakes. But the amazing thing about God is God overcomes all of our mistakes and speaks to us regardless of the Greek text we're using, the Hebrew text we're using, the English translations that we're using. So we need to get rid of our dogmatic responses and just be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit guide us and direct us, because the Holy Spirit guided and directed the people to translate the King James Version of the Bible. God, through the Holy Spirit, directed the people who translated the New International Version of the Bible. Even though I'm not a big fan of it, God still speaks through the NIV very powerfully. People's lives are transformed and have been for decades by the NIV. People's lives are transformed by the today's English version. That was something I used to read back when I was in, uh, in elementary school and high school, went to camp. Today's English version was kind of the hottest version uh, in the land back in those days. Today, we've got other translations. It doesn't matter. 
God is faithful, God will speak. In fact, I'm going to say something that you might take as very controversial. It isn't. An atheist who is attentive and respectful, and they are respectful, by the way, many of them, biblical scholars, or many atheistic biblical scholars. An atheistic biblical scholar who understands what is at stake in translating these words, in other words, the scholarly things, and works very hard in a scholarly fashion to translate the Bible, will present you with a Bible that will transform your life. Jesus Christ will transform your life through a translation of an atheist. I've read translations by atheists. They do some really fine work. Because they're not trying to deceive you. They're just trying to go literally as much as possible what the Bible's trying to say. They disagree with it, but they're still trying to translate the words of the Bible. But God will touch you and transform you from their translation of the Bible because the Holy Spirit cannot be put down, cannot be quashed, cannot be put under the carpet. God will speak regardless of the translation. You know, it reminds me of Martin Luther uh, back in the time of the Reformation. Some people asked him, concerned about the fact that they were all the people were baptized by unfaithful priests. Priests who didn't really believe in Jesus. He said, are they all going to hell? And Luther said, are you crazy? Baptism. Holy Communion, the reading of the Word of God, has nothing to do with the priest who performs the actions. So even if you have an ungodly priest who baptized you, who preached every single Sunday, and who again administered the sacraments every Sunday, God still is in those sacraments. Because it's not about the priest. It's about God. So I'm here to leave you with this today. The Bible is all about God coming and communicating to you. God can overcome these centuries of discrepancies, of disagreements about uh, how the book should be translated, how it was passed on to us. The Holy Spirit always bridges that gap and brings us to faith. I want to leave you today with just a prayer. Thank you again for joining me. I'm so grateful for this. Please take a look online for uh, different resources that I'll be providing for you. The bibliography will be there. The book of 1 Clement will be there, but they will probably be on our Revolution Church Facebook page and not the Holy Trinity page. Because again, Holy Trinity, I should say, is a, is a Facebook page. Revolution is a group. For some reason, in groups, they allow you to post PDFs of documents, but you can't post PDFs and pages baffled why Facebook does that. Nevertheless, we'll give you a link so you can go ahead and download those PDFs on First Clement or uh, uh, the other documents. I'm even going to post uh, my notes for this class online should you want to go ahead and take those and read it a little bit more fully and, and digest that and then you can certainly come back and ask any questions. But I'm going to pray for you today and leave you with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for the faithfulness of those who've, who've soldiered through this class and, and taken the opportunity to open up their minds to the great thing that you've done through the Holy Scripture. How you spoke to us a word, your word, despite our human frailties, our, despite our human inefficiencies, despite our human mistakes, even God sometimes our intentional human meddling with the text. The Holy Spirit overcomes all of these things and transforms our life. Oh, so we give you thanks for your holy word of God. And we thank you for touching us. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I'm going to send you forth in peace today with a benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God give you peace. May God rid of you that dogmatism in your life that alienates other people that alienates you from those who need to hear about Jesus the most. May God give you peace and love in your heart. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Hey, we'll see you next time. I do have some other classes planned for us in the future. If you have any ideas, questions that you might have, classes you'd like me to teach, let me know. We'll see what we can do. Thank you all.